insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 21, Mad About Disney. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my lovely and talented co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hello, my love. How are you today, dear? Uh, yeah. I'm okay. Yeah, one of those days. I know you're not feeling so well. Yeah, I, I had some sort of weird illness that's still kind of lingering, so I'm kind of in a fog. So. Well, I appreciate you mustering up the energy to join us today for this. Why, it thank you. just wouldn't be the same without you. Since I pretty much wrote it all. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> Good job patting yourself on the back there. Uh, okay. I can kind of do that. So, in our Disney Detective, we have some Little Mermaid casting news. We have some box office information on Aladdin. And then we will move on to our entertainment news. Some sad news about a magazine I think both of us uh, were fond of Mm -hmm, in our earlier years. Some uh, casting news on Doctor Strange. The Michael Jackson uh, leaving Neverland controversy that just doesn't seem to want to go doesn't away. Doesn't want to go away. Then we have a brief in memorial, and then we'll move on to our insightful picks of the week. And I don't think we have afterthoughts unless they actually turn out to be truly afterthoughts <laughs> by the time we get there. Because sometimes that does happen. That does happen. We go on the fly. So, shall we get into it, dear? Let's do it. All right. Go for a Disney detective. So, more Little Mermaid uh, news has been popping up. Um, just the other day, uh, it was announced that R&B singer Haley Bailey, not... Halle Berry <laughs> um, has been tapped to Total play. Total disclosure, that's what I thought it was when I first saw <laughs> has it. Has been tapped to play Ariel in the live action. And what's actually kind of funny is about that is that you're not the only one. There were many, many people. There were actually many people on Twitter that had actually congratulated Halle Berry. Right. And she... Didn't even, hadn't heard the news yet and was like, wait, what? And she actually sent out tons of congratulations to Halle Bailey. So now what, what Bailey. Disney needs to do is have a role, cameo role for Halle Berry. Right, now. like to play the mom right, or something, right. you know, in the movie. That, that would actually be kind of cool. So although uh, Rob Marshall, who we mentioned before, who's going to be the director of it, he spent many months, you know, meeting with various people. She obviously got the uh, the nod. She and her sister are actually part of an R&B group. Uh, it's Chloe X. Haley, I guess is uh, the, the name of the group. Um, and they've actually been together since 2015 as a group. They actually started out as YouTube performers covering... Um, Beyonce songs and they actually got discovered through that and actually at one point in time opened for Beyonce on her Lemonade tour so that was kind of cool how her and her sister kind of came up Um, she's uh, currently in uh, stars in the Freeform series Grown-ish which is a spinoff of Blackish so she's you know been, been up and coming So she obviously uh, just got cast. Um, They've also, uh, there's um, Jacob uh, Tremblay, I believe is his last name, who has been tagged to play Flounder. And uh, rapper Aquafina is going to be playing Scuttle. 
Obviously, last week we talked about Melissa McCartney. Um, it seems it's still in talks. She hasn't a hundred percent been picked for Ursula, but it, it's you know it it's uh, obviously very very close to to being finalized. So obviously, there's a lot of back and forth about this being her her being picked. There are some people that are like, "This is awesome. This is great." There are some people that are like, how can a <laughs> um, a black woman be the Little Mermaid? And a lot of people are like, it's a fish. Right. What does it matter what right. color? Doesn't matter what color you are. <laughs> you know, it, it's one thing, you know, Jasmine, you know, Mulan, you know, Merida. Yes, those are you know ethnic Eth- stories stories right you wouldn't have you know certain other characters playing those but we're talking about a fish here right um she can be whatever she wants to be and actually what's been really cool too is there's uh, a whole bunch of fan art that has actually popped up now with her as you know the little mermaid right, right. beautiful you know renditions of her with like purpley red hair and and things like that there was actually another um, uh, another quote I saw um, that was basically from a, fa- um, a fan who, hey, when I was growing up, I was a little redhead girl that didn't have anybody, you know, to look up to. And when The Little Mermaid came out, I was able to say, hey, look, I'm just like The Little Mermaid. Now there's going to be a whole generation of little you know, black girls who are going to be able to say, hey, look, I'm just like the Little Mermaid. Well, and and on that same note, Disney does tend to have a a disparity of uh, minorities when it comes to their Mm -hmm. princess lineup. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's kind of nice to see them diversifying the princess lineup now. Because not every little girl out there is is a Caucasian girl. And you have... You know, these other little girls that want to be able to say, I'm just like, you know, whoever. And here's, you know, here's a great opportunity. You know, Ariel is is kind of a feisty little girl who, you know, grows up very quickly. So, you know. And and again, it's the role itself is an ethnically agnostic role. Exactly. It could have been. So it doesn't matter. You know, you could have had. An Asian girl. An Asian and, you know. It, that doesn't matter. Could have been Native American. Could girl have been Native you American. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I, you know, kudos to Disney for diversifying mm-hmm. for this. And and the other thing is now you've got two Little Mermaids mm-hmm. that you can look up to. Absolutely. What, what is wrong with that? Nothing at all. So. Nothing at all. So good for them. Yeah. So you know, definitely looking looking forward to to that. So in other Disney news, talking about a current live action, which is Aladdin. Disney's Aladdin ha- is becoming one of Disney's most successful live-action remakes of an animated feature film. The movie crossed the 900 million mark at the global box office. On Friday, Disney announced that the film had already pulled in 897.3 million globally and would be joining six other live-action movies to cross the 900 uh, million dollar mark. Ready, everybody? So today we are on set filming Aladdin and it's just so magical. This live action Aladdin took my breath away growing up with this character and I always remember Jasmine as strong and knows her own mind. When I think of when I was a little girl, she was the character I would always play because I could relate in some way. What we're trying to do is reimagine with a modern twist to it. What Naomi has done with Jasmine is powerful and really unique. She brings that sense of empowerment to the character. As a character that you know, but it's a refreshing incarnation. Princess Jasmine wants the best for Agrabah, and what's best for them is if she leads. But rather than say that she wanted to lead, she shows the skills and the qualities of a leader. She has big aspirations, and she sees a future that's greater for the kingdom and the city of Agrabah. The story is a progression of how she finally speaks out and becomes the leader that she's destined to be. Today, we are filming one of the new songs, Speechless. Speechless. 
she says, enough is enough. I have a choice here and I'm going to stand up for what I believe in. It's such a strong song. It's going to be really special. Very cool. So at some point we're, we'll actually get around to see. Summer is always busy for us. We always have lots of things going on on the weekend, so we need to definitely make time for it. So this puts the film in the categories like Beauty and the Beast, Jungle Book, Alice in Wonderland, and the three Pirates of the Caribbean movies in that $900 million live action. Um, so in total, there are 55 films that have reached this mark for the Walt Disney Company. Um, Aladdin is currently the third biggest movie of the year, following Marvel Studios, Avengers Endgame, and Captain Marvel. But this is actually the number one movie for the Disney Studios, not right. under, you know, Marvel, even though that's part of the group. And Disney's Aladdin, you know, has been a pleasant surprise. It was projected to make 75 to 85 million during um, its opening weekend back at uh, during Memorial Day, and it actually made 117. So it obviously did a lot better than most people were were thinking. It's all good news for Disney stockholders, right? <laughs> <It> sure is. <laughs> <laughs> we happen to be them. Uh, <laughs> one of many. Um, you know, so it obviously it it gives Disney validation that remaking you know, animated classics is is working out for them. And obviously we see that with them going forward with, you know, The Little Mermaid. Um, yeah, so every every live action that they've made so far has been successful. They've right. not had issues with yeah, issues with They any haven't had any issues. And and it's nice that even though they're remaking them, there is something different about it. Right. You know, and that was and so that's kind of nice for the people you know, for the fans who, you know, remember the movies from when they were a kid and now they get to go and there's at least something, you know, I kind of know the story, but I don't know the whole story. And that was kind of the same thing with um, with Beauty and the Beast. It yeah. was an interesting twist. You know, you kind of knew this was this was this. And then all of a sudden you were like, oh, that's a nice little twist that I didn't see coming. You and know, the nice thing is it doesn't. It doesn't obsolete the old movies. Mm -mm. The old movies still stand on their own as their own story. Mm -hmm. And these are, you know, an addition to those stories. Right. And again, there's usually always some new songs like we just saw, you know, from yep. the clip here. You know, you have some original songs, you know, some of the original songs from the original animation, uh, animated movie, and then something new to throw in. And, you know, again, the characters have a different twist or... Or something. So it's it's nice that it's it's a familiar, but yet it's still kind of new as well. Right, and they they complement the original movies. I think mm -hmm. is what the important thing is. Absolutely, absolutely. So that is it for Disney Detectives. All righty. So on to our entertainment news. We have the discontinuation of publishing of a magazine that I think you and I both read in our youth. Yeah, this was, this was actually kind of sad news. Um, and actually I saw it through a tweet from weird Al. Oh, wow. Um, and so, uh, mad magazine has decided that it is going to cease new publications more so on their regular basis. Um, so Mad Magazine, which has been famous for, you know, What Me Worry um, and the mascot of Alfred E. Newman, is uh, going to be coming off the newsstands. Um, the owner, DC, sent out a email on Wednesday night talking about it. It said that after um, issue 10, there would be no new content except for end-of-year specials, which would still be all new. Um, and that anything else that came out would kind of be best of stuff. So, uh, it's been in publication for 67 years. So that's a pretty long time for, you know, for that type of thing. Obviously the magazine was sold mostly in comic shops. Um, and you know, you had subscribers that, that got it in the mail. 
Um, DC did not explain why, you know, the the stopping um, of this. Uh, The magazine was founded in 1952 by editor Harvey Kurtzman and publisher William Gaines. It actually debuted as a comic book in 1952 and then switched to a magazine format three years later. Um, The long-running comics featured uh, included The Spy vs. Spy and a back page uh, fold. You know, there was always a, a back page that you'd have to fold to get some sort of secret message. Like I said, uh, Weird Al was among those lamenting about the news on Twitter on Wednesday night, saying that he was profoundly sad to hear about the developments. He said, I can't begin to describe the impact that it had on me as a young kid. It's pretty much the reason why I turned out weird. Uh, Goodbye to one of the (laughs) all-time greatest American institutions. And yeah, it. I I remember, you know, reading Mad Magazine, you know, as a kid. I, you know, I don't think I read it every issue that it came out, but it was definitely one of those things when I went to a store and saw it and I had, you know, allowance money. Yeah. See, I never, I never bought them or had the subscription. My best friend did. Okay. And I remember going over his house every time a new subscription came out and we'd sit mm-hmm. there and pay through the whole thing. That's awesome. You used to love reading the Spy vs. Spy mm-hmm. comics. That was always my favorite part. Yeah, I always liked the parodies of the movies or, you yeah, know, like I, yeah. I seem to remember there was like a Back to the Future one and, you know, uh, it was all the pop culture-y things. Obviously, a lot of the political stuff I didn't understand back then, so right. it would actually kind of be interesting to go back and read it now. And that's why and- <laughs> I think starting with episode 11, you know, issue 11, when they start doing some of the best ofs, right. it'll be interesting to go back and see oh, some definitely. of Oh, I, definitely. I would definitely be interested in, in going back and seeing, you know, some of the stuff that, you know, I didn't, you know, see uh, uh, as a kid. Um, I have to wonder if the, the push towards digital publishing is... That what could be because we've seen, you know, you've seen that with a lot of publications that, you know, they they realize that people aren't getting things in print anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, you even see it when you you look online at certain magazines or or um, newspapers where you're allowed so many free ones, and, and they now, put everything behind a paywall. You now. know, now you have to pay because they need to make some sort of money. So. You know, I could see. You well, know. and I was, you know, looking at this and looking at some of the clearing house services like Apple's News Plus now, mm-hmm. where you pay a flat subscription and you get access to all of this content. I have to wonder if moving towards that model would be what what a magazine like Mad Magazine would have mm-hmm. to do in yeah, order to maybe. To and maybe that's something you know. Maybe you know they'll have so many people start you know, buying it again, that maybe they'll realize, hey, you know what, maybe we can put out, you know, more content, maybe not do, because I think they were, um, it was every other month that a new issue was coming out. And that's the interesting thing about the path that they're going here, is they're not killing the magazine, they're just not putting it in a certain... Right, there's still going to be a, right. There's still going to be a year end special, which you know maybe it'll be thicker than but you like, know the other one. They're still publishing it for subscribers, for right. instance, right? And it's still going to be available in comic books. So, so this might be one of those you know wake up calls of okay, guys, the industry is really not moving in a direction that we can sustain things mm-hmm. here. Here's your first warning. Here's your shot across the bow. Right, right. That. If we don't continue some traditional media uh, outlets here, this magazine is going to go away, and here's the first outlet that you're losing. Mm-hmm. So it might it might just be a marketing ploy. Could be to try Could and be. get people in, interested in the magazine. So we so. shall see. Cool. So in uh, sort of Disneyish, not Disneyish moves, uh, it looks like Matt Smith might be playing the main villain in Doctor Strange Two. While Marvel hasn't officially released Doctor uh, Who too, <laughs> Doctor Strange. Oh, Doctor Strange too. I'm sorry. <laughs> Very funny. While Marvel hasn't revealed um, where they are for Phase Four yet, speculation is that during Comic Con that's supposed to be occurring next month, that that's where more news um, 
will be coming out. But obviously, Doctor Strange was a very uh, beloved character. So the fact that, you know, him getting a second movie was already on the horizon. Uh, it sounded like that they were actually looking um, to do the character Baron uh, Mordo. Modo? Mordo. Mordo. Baron Mordo. Um, that was the character that they were thinking that they were going with. And I guess now they're thinking about um, Nightmare. Okay. And that that's who Matt Smith is going to be playing. So it's Doctor Strange versus Doctor Who. <laughs> right. And basically that was one of the things that, you know, that the news coming out was going to be kind of exciting for... Um, fans of Doctor Who slash Sherlock because for years they wanted some kind of crossover between the two and hey this is how you're going to get it in a completely different well it is worth way. noting that the the uh, Infinity Stone that uh, Doctor Strange possesses is the Time Stone right so, so it does make make sense so so the so the villain here here's the plot line okay so the villain here steals the Time Stone okay puts it in an old police box and turns it into a <laughs> In the, a TARDIS, right? Right. That would be awesome. And it's your biggest nightmare or exactly. something like that. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and this was kind of funny was that they said, you know, that uh, in the article that they were already able to bring two Sherlock's together in uh, Avengers uh, Infinity War and Endgame because you had, obviously, um, Benedict. Cumberbatch, who played Sherlock in the BBC, yep. and then you have Robert Downey Jr., who played Sherlock in the the movies, the right. more recent movies, and there was the funny meme, you know, that, great, you brought these two Sherlocks together, they should have had some sort of line, you know, no shit, Sherlock, <laughs> between the two of them. Um, so it'll be nice to, to have Sherlock and Doctor Who together in, in, in some way. Um, so obviously we'll he probably hear more about this, you know, after San Diego uh, Comic-Con right. happens. So the last story that we have today in our entertainment section um, is kind of a follow-up to one of our original stories when we first started our, our podcast. It's the zombie story that won't the die. The zombie story. Um, so obviously there was the documentary that was done that was on HBO um, call it, uh, called Leaving Neverland, which was basically following um, some of the accusers of Michael Jackson and, you know, where they were um, now and, and, and whatnot. Um, so now it seems that there is a group um, from various fan clubs who are suing Wade Robson and James Safechuck, who are the two subjects of the HBO documentary Leaving Neverland. Um, as Rutgers reports, the three organizations, which are the Michael Jackson Community, the MJ Street, and on the line, allege that the documentary is sullying Jackson's image and are seeking a symbolo symbolic damages of one euro each, which is a dollar thirteen. Not really sure why, but you know why you would. Yeah, it's the documentary that's sullying his images, not the actions that <laughs> Jackson took action. while he was alive. Yeah, so it was very odd. So the three fan clubs are suing in France due to the country's more strict. Uh, defamation laws, um, which extend beyond a person's lifetime. The, the group's lawyer, Emmanuel Ludo, uh, won a similar case in 2014 against Jackson's doctor, Conrad Murray, who had been supplying the pop star with drugs in the days before his death. Um, regarding the fan club's case, the lawyer um, compared Robson and Safechuck's allegations to a genuine lynching of Jackson. Okay, well. Right. <laughs> this is this is another case of everyone's entitled to be offended by something, and we're going to be offended by this. Right, so. Um, How did you even get a lawyer to take this case with no money involved? I don't know. So the lawyer basically said, in France, you cannot sully the images of the dead, um, which is why he decided to take the case. There are moral and emotional suffering, and uh, when there's suffering, there's compensation. It's very simple. 
So a judge, a court's judgment uh, is supposed to be delivered around October 4th on this. So, well, And I think the problem you run into with this is they have to prove that the statements said in the documentary are false. Right. And how do you and do that? You, right. You I can't mean, <laughs> because you have he said, he said, and the one person is no longer around to right. to defend themselves. So, and again, because they're only doing it to get a dollar out of it. Right. Dollar 13. A dollar thirteen. Well, uh, one euro. One euro. <laughs> so, I don't know. I guess it, you know, just let this it is, be this already. Is, this is some fan clubs that are just screaming for attention. Is all well, and is. and kind of an interesting thing was a, a a different article that I saw, kind of going back to um, Weird Al, is I saw that he had actually made a statement that in his upcoming concert tour, which we're actually going to be seeing this coming Friday. Um, Which I don't know how that didn't make it in the afterthoughts. <laughs> well, because it's actually sold out, so I didn't want anybody going. Uh, and that was kinda... But is the whole tour sold out? No, I don't uh, believe the whole tour see? is sold out. All right, fine, we can throw it in the afterthoughts. Uh, anyway, he actually had made a comment that he wasn't going to be performing any of his Michael Jackson parodies. Like 70% of his act is all Michael Jackson <laughs> no, parodies. Michael Jackson pr proved to be such a target rich environment. Well, for him. that's the thing is, you know, Eat It and Fat were, were really the, the big two yeah. you know, for him. But yeah, he kind of was backing away because that there's so much controversy right now going on. No, I you think know. that's silly that he would back away from that. Well, I guess we'll find out on Friday when we. When we go to the concert, yeah. if he if he changes his mind, so that is it in entertainment news. All righty, I think we have a brief, fortunately, a brief in memoriam this we week. We do. Who have we lost this week? So this week we actually lost a comedian, uh, Artie Johnson. He was uh, one of the stars on Laughing. That's probably where most people would recognize him. Um, he was an Emmy-winning star of the 60s and 70s, uh, the sketch comedy show Laugh-In. Um, he actually died on July 3rd in Los Angeles of heart failure. Uh, he was 90 and had been battling bladder and prostate cancer. Um, again, he was most known for... Um, Starring on Laughing, uh, one of his famous uh, characters was Wolfga Wolfgang, who had a very heavy German accent, and his catchphrase was very interesting. Uh, so that's yeah. so you know if you don't know who he was, you you know you know some of his characters. Uh, he was born in Michigan, and he actually started out performing in New York nightclubs. Was cast uh, in The Gentleman Preferred Blondes on stage. He ended up moving to television, starring in you know various uh, episodes of, of different shows like The Twilight Zone, um, uh, Hennessy, and Sally. Um, then he actually went on to do episodes of Bewitched, Lost in Space, The Partridge Family, The Donna Reed Show. Uh, he ended up making a, a couple of uh, uh, movies or, or, you know, um, co-stars, you know, uh, where I actually remembered him from was playing um, Renfield in Love at First Bite. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> So that's where I always remembered him from. Um, but then later on, he, you know, he went through the game show phase, you know, the celebrity game shows of, um, excuse me, of the match game and Wheel of Fortune and Gong Show. Uh, and then he even did, you know, stuff in the 80s with Murder, She Wrote, Night Court, General Hospital. And actually, he ended up doing extensive voiceover work. Um, for Justice, Justice League uh, Unlimited, The 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, DuckTales, and Animaniacs. Wow, that is a distinguished career. Yeah, so, you know, not, not so bad. Uh, he, survived of his, uh, he is survived by his wife of 51 years and an older brother. Um, so, sad news, but a good life and a good legacy to Living leave behind. Living 90 with a career like that. You know, that's that's impressive. That sure is. All righty. So are we ready for insightful picks of the week? I believe we are.
And to you, my dear. Why, thank you, my love. So uh, my show this week is from The CW. It's called The 100. Um, It's actually in its sixth season right now. And actually, this past April has been renewed for a seventh season. Um, So basically, the premise behind the show is when when nuclear Armageddon destroys the civilization on Earth, the only survivors are those on 12 international space stations that are in orbit at the time. Three generations later, the 4,000 survivors living on this space arc of Link Station see that their resources are dwindling and are facing draconian measures established to um, ensure humanity's future. So they're desperately looking for a solution. The ARC leaders decide to send a hundred, hence the... <laughs> the uh, So that's where that comes <laughs> that's from. That's where it comes from. Uh, juvenile prisoners back to the planet to test if it's habitable. Um, so and, Earth becomes Australia then. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, so having always lived in space, the exiles find the planet fascinating and terrifying, but the fate of the human race is in their hands, and they must forge a path into the unknown. Um, so basically it starts off 97 years after there's been this nuclear apocalypse, um, and when the first hundred kids basically go down, they end up finding out that they're not alone, that there's a couple of races that have been on Earth ever since and have kind of mutated, Um, you know, so you have one group of people called the mountain people who basically had locked themselves in um, a bunker when, you know, before things had started, then you had, you know, the other group of people who were left out in the open and basically learned how to deal with the um, the radiation that had occurred to them and, you know, this fight between all of them. Um, this current season actually jumped like 125 years because stuff had happened on earth they basically had to leave because earth was basically destroyed and now they're on this other planet where they found people from when earth was actually still around and the start of this apocalypse happened and you had a group of scientists that kind of went off earth to kind of recreate you know, our civilization someplace else. So now they're dealing with those, you know, people. So it's, it's, you know, it started out really good and then I kind of lost interest for a little while and then I kind of came back to it. So that's where I am with it right now. So giving it another try. Okay. Interesting. Good pick. Thank you. So my pick of the week here, should come as no surprise, is a documentary. Oh my goodness, I would have never realized it. Uh, Not a science one or a history one. Really? This time. This is actually a music documentary. Very different for you. Yes, this is uh, number eight in an eight-part documentary series called Remastered, produced by Netflix. It's a 2018 documentary. This one is The Lion's Share. Uh, in this eighth and final installment of the remastered music documentary series, director Sam Coleman and showrunners Jeff and Mike Zimbalist uh, pick up on the trails of three uh, converging parties. Uh, South African writer and documentarian Ryan Milan, uh, Zulu musician Solomon Linda, and a two-time Billboard Top Ten hit. The result is a well-crafted and sophisticated account of bitterness, longing, and the all-too-common exploitation of black talent for white gain. So in this one, they actually uh, dig into the origins of the song, The Lion Sleeps Tonight. Interesting. It was originally a South African song from um, uh, an artist uh, who didn't, understand the idea of even licensing you know music and stuff they did it for pure social and uh enjoyment uh by the name of solomon linda back in the 1920s and 30s and uh, it eventually was adopted by an american folk singer pete singer uh seeger 
um, who acknowledged the fact that it you know wasn't his original, and he sort of insisted that royalties be paid back to okay. the descendants of the original artist, and the recording uh, company basically ignored that, and <laughs> there was a long, drawn-out legal battle, ultimately culminating in... Uh, a legal fight with Disney mm-hmm. for the 1994 version of Lion King in which the okay. song featured prominently. Um, and as much as I would have liked to have used this as an example to say how evil Disney is, Disney did initially fight it. Um, and and I, after watching the entire documentary, I could understand why mm-hmm. uh, because they were really trying to use this obscure – British copyright law that South Africa had adopted. Okay. And, you know, Disney basically said, you know, we're not buying it. And they tried to appeal to the, uh, the court system in South Africa. But when the lawsuit turned out to be valid or validated in the court system, uh, they immediately attempted to settle for a reasonable sum of money for back royalties. And they agreed to pay royalties moving forward under the, under the law. All right. So um, Disney even went a step further and suggested that the money itself, instead of being paid out to a lump sum to the three daughters, the three surviving daughters of Solomon and Linda, who at the time were, were basically living in abject poverty. Mm, okay. um, and the settlement, you know, if you do the math, the settlement was about two, two and a half million dollars, somewhere in there. Okay, not, um, not, nothing to sneeze at. No, and Disney's point was, well, if you drop two and a half million dollars on these people, they're not going to know what to do with it. They're not going to know how mm-hmm. to spend it. And they're going to it's going to get wasted, right? So Disney had actually um, suggested, but didn't insist on having it put into a trust fund and have the trust fund manage for them, so it could be delved out, you know, okay. and, and managed. And that's exactly what happened. And it turns out that you know they still managed to to waste the money. And, mm, shame, you know, but. Uh, but very good documentary. Um, I, the thing that I found, the story itself of the origins of the song and the trials and tribulations it went through to get to the point where it was at and how it was stolen and so forth was fascinating. What I really found interesting was this um, journalist, this South African journalist, uh, Ryan Milan, it was almost as much a journey for him and his soul as it was for the song. Mm, interesting. Because he's the grand nephew of Daniel Francois Milan, who was the first South African prime minister who basically implemented apartheid. And and he um Ryan had this overwhelming sense of guilt at what his family had imposed on the black South Africans that he was desperately trying to find some way to work towards forgiveness. And he latched onto this story here, knowing how important this song, which initially the song was called Mm Mumbe, which is the lion. And that eventually became anglicized into a Wimba way, which became a song on its own in the 50s. And then eventually in the 60s, the song itself was given uh, anglicized lyrics lyrics Mm -hmm. and became The Lion King. And he knew how important it was from a cultural standpoint. You know, we talk about cultural appropriation today. Mm -hmm. On a regular basis. Well, back then, you know, it happened all the time. It happened all the time and nobody thought differently about it. So uh, Ryan wanted to find some kind of – perform some kind of penance for the South Africans at, at you know, recompense for what his family mm-hmm. had caused. And this was the crusade that he took up. And this was like a 30-year crusade for this man oh, to wow. finally get some kind of restitution given to the sisters. And the sisters ultimately wound up well off, more well off than they were for it. Mm-hmm. And it was it was touching to see his side of the story because the documentary follows the sisters, it follows the song, but there's subtle undertones to Ryan Milan and his story. Mm. And that touched me more than anything else was that this guy was really trying to save 
you know, not his family name, but his own sense of guilt at something he didn't do. He it didn't, was something that his no family of, had right. done. Um, so it's a very good documentary, and I'm, I'm actually inspired now to go back and look at the other seven documentaries in the series now. Mm-hmm. But uh, Remaster the Lion's Share is a 2018 documentary on Netflix, and I recommend it. Very good pick. So we'll come back with an afterthought, right? Yes, we will. All right. Let's get weird. (laughs) How did you know that was going to be it? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So as we mentioned, uh, this Friday we are going to be seeing Weird Al Yankovic um, with his Strings Attached tour. Um, We're actually going to be seeing it in Philadelphia at the Met which is a new um, venue that just opened recently. Uh, I believe they renovated it. So I'm actually looking forward to to seeing what it looks like. If you uh, look at pictures of it, it, it looks like that old classic type you know, theater from, you know, the turn of the century type. Oh, like when Lincoln got shot in. Right. <laughs> Um, so yes, it is actually sold out. So if you are from the Philadelphia area, um, you might be able to find tickets. Um, the you know. Philly show is sold out. Right. The Philly show is, is sold out. He's actually playing in Cleveland, Ohio tonight, which is sold out. Pittsburgh the next night, which is sold out. Then he's going to Ontario, Canada. That one actually looks like there's tickets available. Syracuse, which will be Thursday, uh, the 11th, there are tickets available for. Then he plays Philadelphia. Then he goes down to North Carolina, Virginia, then up to New Hampshire, Connecticut, uh, New York on July 20th. So I'm guessing there's a website people can look at. Yes. This up. If you actually go to weirdal.com backslash tour, you can find all of his tour dates. It looks like. Uh, Right now, the tour goes until September 1st, um, ending right now at uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, at the Verizon Arena, and there are tickets available for that. So it looks like there's a couple of shows here and there that are sold out, but for the most part, if you happen to be in an area, um, uh, definitely go and see it. Uh, This is when when he did his tour last year, um, it was a very, we never got tickets for it. Cause I don't think he, I think maybe he was in Atlantic city last year. It was uh, much smaller venues and it was much, um, it was a much more obscure concert. He was playing basically a lot of his quote unquote B side songs, right. um, more like fan favorites. You know, like if you've collected his albums throughout the years, you knew the songs, but if you were a casual listener of him, you probably didn't know the song so this year uh the concert it's basically he's playing his his hits and his classics doing his big productions with costumes and props and a video wall and actually having his band his original band is all with him background singers and a full symphonic orchestra nice. which will definitely be it'll interesting be, it'll to be say. a big sound for weird al yes it definitely will i've seen him a couple of times throughout the years um always one of my favorite concerts to go see um i don't think you've ever i've never seen him in concert seen him in concert we've kind of turned our daughter on to him so i think she's looking forward to it yeah. so it'll be a, a fun evening for sure well and we'll be back next week hopefully with uh with reviews reviews of it mm-hmm, absolutely so and i think that's all we have for this week thank i believe it is for joining us thank you dear for your time Always. And uh, we'll be back next week with uh, another fresh podcast. All right. Have a good week, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.